and though tribalism was fading in the township, a close friend of mine condemned our relationship on purely tribal grounds. I categorically, categorically rejected this, but our different backgrounds posed certain problems. Mrs. Mabutho, the minister's wife, did not care for Ellen, largely because she was a Swazi. One day, while I was at the Mabutho's, Mrs. Mabutho answered a knock at the door. It was Ellen, who was looking for me, and Mrs. Mabutho told her I was not inside. Only later did she say to me, O oh Nelson, some girl was here looking for you. Mrs. Mabutho then said to me, Is that girl a Shagan? <coughs> Although the Shagans are proud and noble tribe, at the time Schengen was considered a derogatory term. I took offense at this and said, No, she is not a Shagan and she is a Swazi. Mrs. Mabutho felt strongly that I should take out only Zuza girls. Such advice did not deter me. I loved and respected Ellen and felt not a little bit noble in discarding the counsel of those who disapproved. The relationship was to me a novelty and I felt daring in having a friendship with a woman who was not a Zuza. I was young and rather lost in the city and Ellen played the role not only of romantic partner but of a mother, supporting me, giving me confidence and endowing me with strength and hope. But within a few months Ellen moved away and sadly, we lost touch with one another. The Zuma family had five daughters, each of them lovely, but the loveliest of all was named Didi. Didi, about my age, spent most of the week working as a domestic worker in a white suburb of Johannesburg. When I first moved to the house, I saw her only seldom and fleetingly. But later, when I made her acquaintance properly, I also fell in love with her. But Didi barely took any notice of me and what she did notice was the fact that I owned only one patched up suit and a single shirt and that I did not present a figure much different from a tramp. Every weekend, Didi returned to Alexandra. She was brought home by a young man who I assumed was her boyfriend, a flashy well-to-do fellow who had a car, something that was most unusual. He wore expensive double-breasted American suits and wide brimmed hats and paid a great deal of attention to his appearance. He must have been a gangster of some sort, but I cannot be sure. He would stand outside in the yard and put his hands in his waistcoat and look altogether superior. He greeted me politely, but I could see that he did not regard me as much competition. I yearned to tell Didi I loved her, but I was afraid that my advances would be unwanted. I was hardly a Don Juan, awkward and hesitant around girls. I did not know or understand the romantic games that others seemed to play effortlessly. At weekends, Didi's mother would sometimes ask her to bring out a plate of food to me. Didi would arrive on my doorstep with the plate and I could tell that she simply wanted to perform her errand as quickly as possible. But I would do my best to delay her. I would ask her opinion on things all sorts of questions. Now, what standard did you attain in school? I would say standard 5. She replied, why did you leave? I asked, she was bored. She replied, uh, well, you must go back to school, I said. <coughs> you are about the same age as, as I am, I continued. And there is nothing wrong with returning to school at this age. Otherwise, you will regret it when you are old. You must think seriously about your future. It is nice for you now because you are young and beautiful and have many admirers, but you need to have an independent profession. I realized that these are not the most romantic words that have ever been uttered by a young man to a young woman with whom she, he was in love, but I did not know what else to talk to her about. She listened seriously, but I could tell that she was not interested, that in fact she felt a bit superior to me. I wanted to propose to her but I was unwilling to do so unless I was certain she would say yes. Although I loved her, I did not want to give her the satisfaction of rejecting me. I kept up my pursuit but I was timid and hesitant. In love, unlike politics, caution is not usually a virtue. I was neither confident enough to think that I might succeed, nor secure enough to bear the sense of failure if I did not. I stayed at that house for about a year and in the end, I uttered nothing about my feelings. 
Didi did not show any less interest in her boyfriend or any more interest in me. I bid my goodbye with expressions of gratitude for her friendliness and the hospitality of the family. I did not see Didi again for many years. One day much later when I was practicing law in Johannesburg, a young woman and her mother walked into my office. The woman had a child and her boyfriend did not want to marry her. She was seeking to institute an action against him. That young woman was Didi. Only now she looked haggard and wore a faded dress. I was distressed to see her and thought how things might have turned out differently. In the end she did not bring a suit against her boy boyfriend and I never saw her again. Despite my romantic deficiencies I gradually adjusted to township life and began to develop a sense of inner strength. I believed that I could do well outside the world in which I had grown up. I slowly discovered that I did not have to depend on my royal connections or the support of family in order to advance. And I forged relationships with people who did not know or care about my link to the Thembu royal house. I had my own home, humble though it was, and I was developing the confidence and self-reliance necessary to stand on my own two feet. At the end of 1941, I received word that the regent was visiting Johannesburg and wanted to see me. I was nervous but knew that I was obliged to see him and indeed wanted to do so. He was staying at the WNLA compound, the headquarters of the Witwatersrand Native Labour Association, <laughs> the recruiting agency for mine workers along the reef. The region seemed greatly changed or perhaps it was I who had changed. He never once mentioned the fact that I had run away, fought her or the arranged marriage that was not to be. He was courteous and solicitous, questioning me in a fatherly way about my studies and future plans. He recognized that my life was starting in earnest and would take a different course from the one he had envisaged and planned for me. He did not try to dissuade me from my course and I was grateful for this implicit acknowledgement that I was no longer his charge. My meeting with the regent had a double effect. I had rehabilitated myself and at the same time restored my own regard for him and the Thembu royal house. I had become indifferent to my old connections and attitude I had adopted in part to justify my flight and somehow alleviate the pain of my separation from a world I loved and valued. It was reassuring to be back in the region's warm embrace. <laughs> While the region seemed satisfied with me, he was vexed with Justice, who he said must return to make his veni. Justice had formed a liaison with a young woman and I knew he had no intention of going home. After the region departed, Bagin Davo, one of his head headmen, instituted proceedings against Justice. And I, one of his headmen, and I agreed to help Justice when he was called before the native commissioner. At the hearing, I pointed out that Justice was an adult and he did not have to return to Megizbeni merely because his father ordered it. When Bagin Dabo spoke, he did not reply to my argument but played on my own loyalties. He addressed me as Madiba, my, my clan name, something that was well calculated to remind me of my Thambu heritage. Madiba, he said, the regent has cared for you, educated you and treated you like his own son. Now you want to keep his true son for, from him. This is contrary to the wishes of the man who has been your faithful guardian and contrary to the path that has been laid out for justice. Bagin Dawo's speech, speech hit me hard. Justice did have a different destiny from that of myself. He was the son of a chief and a future chief in his own right. After the hearing, I told Justice that I had changed my mind and I thought he should return. <coughs> he was mystified by my reaction and refused to listen to me. He resolved to stay and must have informed his girlfriend of my advice, for she never thereafter spoke to me. At the beginning of 1942, in order to save money and be closer to downtown Johannesburg, I moved from the room at the back of the Zumas to the WNLA compound. I was assisted by Mr. Festile, the Induna at the Chamber of Mines, who was once again playing a fateful role in my life. On his own initiative, he had decided to offer me free accommodation in the mining compound. The WNLA compound was a multi-ethnic polyglot community of modern urban South Africa. There were Sathos, Tathaswana, Vendas, Zulus, Pedis, Schengens, Namibians, Mozambicans, Swazis and Zuzas. Few spoke English and the lingua franca was an amalgam of many tongues known as 
Fanagolo. There, I saw not only flare-ups of ethnic animosity, but the comity that was also possible among men of different backgrounds. Yet I was a fish out of water. Instead of spending my days underground, I was studying or working in a law office where the only physical activity was running errands or putting files in a cabinet. Because the WNLA was a way station for visiting chiefs, I had the privilege of meeting tribal leaders from all over Southern Africa. I recall on one occasion meeting the Queen Regent of Basutoland or what is now Lesotho, Mansito Mohoshwaye. She was accompanied by two chiefs, both of whom knew Sabata's father, Joginswe. I asked them about Joginswe and for an hour I seemed to be back in Thambuland as they told colorful tales about his early years. The queen took special notice of me and at one point addressed me directly, but she spoke in Sesotho, a language in which I knew few words. Sesotho is the language of the Sotho people as well as the Tsitswana, a large number of whom live in the Transvaal, the orange free state. She looked at me with incredulity and then said in English, what kind of layer lawyer and leader will you be who cannot speak the language of your own people? I had no response. The question embarrassed and sobered me. It made me realize my parochialism and just how unprepared I was for the task of serving my people. I had unconsciously succumbed to the ethnic divisions fostered by the white government and I did not know how to speak to my own kith and kin. Without language, one cannot talk to people and understand them. One cannot share their hopes and aspirations, grasp their history, appreciate their poetry, or savor their songs. I again realized that we were not different people with separate languages. We were one people with different tongues.